Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're going to be starting into our investigation about correlation and regression. Uh, if you recall from the last couple of videos, we've been spending a little bit of time talking about statistical studies. And we said that in a statistical study, the goal of a study is to analyze the relationship between two statistical variables. Well, correlation and regression is an attempt to sort of actually study that relationship more mathematically. So for these next few videos, I, it's going to be quite a few because correlation and regression, there's uh, quite a few things to discuss here. Uh, but our goal is going to be to understand, visualize, measure, and use the relationship between two quantitative variables. So there's a couple things to sort of mention here. One is that notice that this is sort of our standard approach that we've been doing throughout this course. Whenever we sort of uh, find a new statistical measure that we want to sort of analyze, we always want to start by trying to make sure we understand what that measure is, come up with some visual display for it, come up with some way to actually measure it mathematically, and then possibly use whatever we're sort of studying to maybe make decisions or in the past so far we've used it mostly to describe the data but now we're actually going to get to do a little bit of inferential statistics and actually make use of the relationship to make some predictions to make some conclusions the other thing to sort of keep in mind with this goal is that everything we're going to be talking about in this correlation and regression section is going to focus on pairs of quantitative variables we'll study how to study the relationship between categorical variables variables in a later section. So for now, everything's going to be about pairs of quantitative variables. As a quick note, uh, which we briefly mentioned when we were also doing our work about statistical studies, is that our terminology is generally explanatory and response variable. Remember that the explanatory variable is the one that we think helps explain the changes or the differences we're seeing in the response variable. But sometimes you'll also see the alternate terminology of independent variable, which is the same as the explanatory, and dependent variable, which is the same as response. So just remember that explanatory is the same as independent, the response is the same as dependent. All right, so let's get to our first sort of piece of this, which is how can we visually display information uh, when we have two separate variables that have been recorded about each individual? How can we get a visual display that will help us understand the potential relationship between two variables? Well, the main visual display that we'll be using in this class is what is called a scatter plot. So what does a scatter plot look like? Well, to draw a scatter plot, you're generally going to give yourself a single uh, quadrant of a coordinate axis. So you'll have two axes here. Uh, there, there is a rule about which variable goes on each axis. We're always going to have the explanatory variable on the horizontal, and we're always going to have the response variable or the dependent variable on the vertical. When you draw your own, when we have data, and we'll have an example of this at the very end of this video, uh, you will need a consistent scale. So you'll have some sort of scale telling us what each of these values are. And same thing here for the response variable. So you'll have a scale with that. Now, as a side note, as we'll see, unlike a lot of the other displays we've been doing, like histograms and bar graphs, which were vertical displays, a uh, scanner plot is a display of a relationship. So you actually don't need these axes to start at zero. And in a lot of the previous cases, we did require that the vertical axis started at zero. But in this case, that's not necessary. If you don't start your axis at zero, uh, it's sometimes referenced as condensing the axis. And sometimes what you'll do is you'll put a little squiggly line here until your first mark, which will indicate condensing the axis. Now, sometimes you'll want to start your axis at zero, and, and, and then you don't need to use this. But if you have uh, values for the variable that are very far away from zero, and you, you don't need to have the axis extend all the way to zero, you can condense the axis. And we usually display that sort of with a little squiggly section of the axis telling us that the axis has been sort of smooshed together and doesn't impact the graph, but just something to be aware of. So what does the actual scatter plot look like? Well, there'll be a bunch of points and each of these points will sort of be graphed at different locations. And again, we'll see an example of this uh, later. So maybe, you know, we have our points looking like that or something. And so each of these points, uh, we'll just make a note here, each point represents a single individual. And you'll graph these points just like you did in like an algebra class. Each of these are an ordered pair. Uh, 
So each of these things is an ordered pair and it'll always be the explanatory variable and the response variable second. So each point represents a single individual who was in your study. And for each individual, you recorded two pieces of information about them, the value of their explanatory variable and the value of their response variable. And then you graph those on your axis, creating what we call a scatter plot. A couple quick comments about this, uh, as just mentioned here. Remember, each individual has two variables measured about them. So each point is a single individual. And for each individual, we measured both an explanatory variable and a response variable. Second, as mentioned, each axis must have a consistent scale. So we'll have to have an appropriate scale on each of the axes. But the axes do not need to start at zero, unlike something like a vertical axis on a histogram or a vertical axis on a bar graph. All right, at the end of this video, we'll actually take some data and build a scatter plot uh, for it. But before we do that, let's talk a little bit about what we're looking for in a scatter plot. In other words, what elements of this are sort of important and how do we want to describe these scatter plots? So there's three sort of things that we want to measure in a relationship between quantitative variables. Some of these will be very easy to measure based entirely on the scatter plot, and some will actually have to learn a more formal statistical measure for it. The first thing we want to understand in a relationship or a potential relationship between quantitative variables is what we call the direction. For our class, we're going to encounter three possible directions. There's positively directed, which generally means that as the explanatory variable increases, so does the response variable. So you can sort of think that in a positive, as you generally see an increase in the explanatory, you also generally see an increase in the response. Then there is negatively directed, which generally means that as the explanatory variable gets larger, so as we move to the right, because remember the explanatory variable is always on the horizontal axis, the response variable generally decreases. So this means that as the explanatory goes up, we generally see a decrease in the response. These are the two directions we're going to encounter the most. Um, these are generally referenced as monotonic. All monotonic means is that it, your, your scatter plot, your graph, is showing a single direction, either positive or negative. Occasionally, we will run into things that are called non-monotonic. And what that means is simply it doesn't have a single direction. That means that the direction is not strictly positive or negative. In other words, the pattern changes direction. So non-monotonic could mean that the pattern or the direction is initially positive and then switches to negative. Or maybe it's initially negative, then switches to positive, and then switches back to negative. In other words, non-monotonic is sort of a catch-all category for more complicated situations. Most of the time, though, we're just going to encounter these monotonic situations with a single direction, either positive or negative. All right. The second major thing that we want to understand in the relationship between quantitative variables is the form. In other words, we're basically going to be saying if we were describing it algebraically, what sort of pattern are we seeing? Right. This sort of tells us the direction. This is much more about the pattern. So again, we're going to have a couple sort of specific ones that we'll encounter and then a catch-all category for everything else that's a little beyond the scope of our class. So the first and most important form for us is going to be linear. This means that generally the pattern looks like a line, which of course must have a single direction. Now, if you think about that, this does not mean that the points themselves are going to lie on an exact line. We're just saying that generally the points seem to form if we were going to describe the pattern as any one form as a linear form. So what might that look like? Well, it could look like something like this where you're sort of seeing a positively directed line. Notice that the points are not on an exact line, but they make a general sort of linear shape, or they could be negatively directed, right? Because we have both directions, so you might see something like that, where again, best description would be sort of, oh, well, they're not perfect, but they generally seem to form a line there. The second form that we'll encounter is what is called exponential. And generally, this is a pattern that looks like a curve, but still with a single direction. In other words, an exponential can sort of be thought about as a linear that has sort of a bend in it. So some examples of that is you could see one that's positive, sort of like this, where 
it gets steeper and steeper. Notice it doesn't really make sense to say that like, that's a line. It makes more sense to sort of view it as a curve like that. Of course, notice that it is still strictly positive. Generally, as we move this way, we're also going this way. Uh, we could also encounter things that look like this, where maybe it's negative, very steep at the beginning, and then starts to sort of taper off, something like that. So now notice again, wouldn't make sense to really call it uh, a linear because the slope sort of changes, right? The slope is very steep here and then less steep here. So you can sort of see it would make more sense to view it as a curve. But notice once again, it does have a single direction. This would be negatively directed. So linear and exponential are both really important forms and they're monotonic forms, meaning that there's positive linear, positive exponential, negative linear, and negative exponential. There is a, another sort of catch-all category, which is what we say nonlinear. This basically means that there is a strong pattern to the data, just like we're seeing here, but it doesn't fit the above descriptions. So an example of that could be something like this, where maybe we initially are seeing an increase, then we're starting to see a decrease, and then we see another increase here. So this right here would be nonlinear because notice it obviously is not a line that doesn't look anything like the pattern. And while it is a curve, there would have to be another part there and another part there. So it is not exponential. You'll notice that this basically does confirm that nonlinear forms go hand in hand with non monotonic. So these two will generally go together because once we don't have monotonicity, once we don't have a single direction, then we're going to have a nonlinear pattern. All right, the third and final thing, uh, which is going to turn out to be the hardest of the things to measure, uh, these first two, direction and form, uh, we will be able to have a pretty good sense of them just based on the scatter plot. But strength, the third and final component, is a little bit harder. So strength, uh, we're going to give a definition here. Basically, the strength of a correlation is how closely the data follows the pattern. So the tighter the points follow the sort of general pattern, the stronger the correlation is. If the points only sort of generally flow around the pattern, but they're very spread out, they're sort of all over the place, that means that the pattern or the correlation is weaker. Now, strength, again, is going to be hard to understand just based on the visualization. So we'll actually need to develop a statistical measure in the next video that will actually allow us to measure this more directly. So we'll talk more about strength as we go further on. Finally, a quick note before we do a quick example with this is that the above terms, the positive, negative, linear, exponential, all these terms, these terms apply when there is a relationship between the two variables. There is always the possibility that we should classify the relationship between two variables as no relationship. And visually, what no relationship should look like is like this, a just a big scatter of points. If you see something like this, just a big scatter of points, there's no pattern, there's no direction to it. You can't say that it's like this here. Yes, this is a complicated pattern, but it's a clear pattern. This, there is no pattern. This means there's no relationship between the variables, which if you think about it, should actually be more common than not, right? I mean, it, just picking out two random variables and saying, oh, there's gonna be some deep relationship between them, probably not the case. Case. So just keep in mind, a totally scattered scatter plot indicates no relationship between the variables. Okay, so we've got two sort of things we'd like to do to wrap this up. One is we'd like to get a little bit more practice uh, just thinking about explanatory and response and the variables and how they connect to the scatter plots, and we should build our own scatter plot. So we're going to do two examples to sort of wrap up this introduction to correlation and regression. So our first example is we're going to do a little bit more practice identifying explanatory and response variables. And then we're also going to use a little bit of common sense to sort of match these variables to their most likely scatter plot. And then we'll also practice describing the scatter plots. So below, we've got four pairs of variables as well as four scatter plots. So here's our four pairs of variables. And if we go down just a little bit, So if we just scroll down just a little bit there, uh, there are our four 
scatter plots. So what are we going to do with this? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take each pair of variables and identify the explanatory and response. Remember, whenever we have a pair of variables coming from a statistical study, one of the variables must be treated as the explanatory and one must be treated as the response. Then, once we've identified which is explanatory and which is response, we'll sort of try to use common sense to match the variables to the most likely scatter plot. Obviously, this is not something we're going to do a ton of. Most of the time, we're going to have data and build our own scatter plot. But just again, to get a little practice here and to sort of make sure we're thinking about this from an intuitive perspective, we'll match the variables to the most likely scatter plot. And then we'll describe the scatter plot. So we'll talk about what form are we seeing, what direction, and maybe we'll discuss a little bit about the strength. So let's take a look at our first pair of variables here. We have the hours studied and the score on an exam. So we're probably studying like students in a class or something like that. And we're saying how many hours did they study and what score did they get on some particular exam? So in this pair, which would we treat as explanatory and which would we treat as response? Well, it hopefully should be clear that the hours studied should be treated as explanatory and the scores should be response. We would think that perhaps the hours you study should have some impact on the score you receive. Is it the only thing that impacts the score you receive? Absolutely not, but it doesn't really make sense to say that the score you received impacts the hours you studied. If anything, just chronologically, you would spend the hours studying first and then you would get your score on the exam. So this should be treated as explanatory, this should be a response. All right, let's think about which of these scatter plots is the most likely. So. Here, we're sort of seeing something where we're say to, saying that when we have low values of the explanatory, we get low values of the response. So low hours studied, low scores on the exam. Okay, that seems to make sense. Then we're sort of saying middle values of the explanatory give us high values of the response. So if you study a middle amount, you'll get a very good score on the exam. And then it's seemingly saying that for high values of the explanatory, well, we should get low values of the response. So if you study a lot, a lot, you'll get a bad score. Mm, that doesn't quite seem to make sense. Something like this, well, this seems to be saying that as you go this way, as you study more, because remember, explanatory always on the horizontal, that your score should go down. So this doesn't seem to make sense. Mm, this one here, well, it seems like it's all over the place. That doesn't seem like a strong pattern. And then we have this one here which seems to say that as you study more, right, as you go this way, these scores seem to go up. And then it seems to be that even if you study a lot, lot more, your score doesn't go up too much more, but at least it is higher than if you didn't study at all. So it seems most likely that this should be matched to the fourth scatter plot. So this should go to scatter plot four. So we're sort of saying that this would be the hours studied, and this would be the score on exam. Now, again, does that make sense? Well, this is saying that if you study very few hours, so a low amount down here, then you should get probably a low score. And it's saying if you study more hours as we go this way, we generally see an increase. And then it's sort of saying that if you study a ton, ton more, if you go all the way down here, it doesn't help you that much more which should sort of make sense. If we've ever studied for an exam, the difference between maybe only studying an hour and like four hours, big difference. There's a difference between studying like 12 hours and 13 hours, probably less impactful. So this really does make sense. How would we describe this? Well, again, if we're looking at that sort of general pattern, we're seeing something like that. So certainly that is positively directed. So we'll put that over here. So this is positive. So it is monotonic, it has a single direction, which means we can classify it as linear or exponential. Notice it doesn't make sense to talk about linear because the line, well, this slope would be too steep. And if we sort of drew a line here, it wouldn't be steep enough. It has that bend or it has that curve in it. So this would be exponential. What sort of strength would we say? Well, again, strength is very hard to say visually, um, again, because we don't really know the scale and everything like that, but it does seem medium strong, right? If we put, put that uh, curve in there, the points do seem to be pretty close around that if we're looking at it. So we might guess that this is medium strong. Now again, we are going to learn a measure in our next video that'll actually help us do that mathematically and be a lot more accurate about it. But again, the tighter these points are, the closer these points are to whatever your sort of pattern is, the stronger the relationship. All right, let's try the next pair here. 
So the next pair of variables is we have the number of visitors at an amusement park and the daily high temperature. So does it make sense to say that the number of visitors impacts the daily high temperature or that the temperature impacts the number of visitors? Well, we would probably guess that the temperature should be the explanatory and the visitors should be the response. Again, we'd probably think that the high temperature might impact how many people choose to go to the amusement park. All right, so which of these diagrams seems to make sense? Well, we might be tempted to use this one. Right? We're saying if the temperatures are really, really cold, so if this is really cold here, not many people go. If it's really, really hot, not many people go. But if it's right in the middle, if it's a nice sort of day, lots of people go to the amusement park. So we might associate this with graph one. So we could put the temperature here and the number of visitors here. Notice it wouldn't really make sense to put it here, which would just mean that as it gets hotter and hotter, less and less people go. Uh, that doesn't really quite seem to make sense. And this one would basically be saying that temperature has no relationship to number of visitors. So again, it doesn't make sense. So probably this guy would make sense here. Now, how would we describe this? Well, notice if we were sort of just saying roughly the pattern, we're seeing something sort of like an upside down U shape. That means it sort of goes from positive and then into negative, meaning it's non-monotonic. So this would be described as non-monotonic. It's, if we want it to be very specific, I guess it's positive and then negative. Since it's non-monotonic, it can't be linear or exponential, so we would just have to call it non-linear, which makes sense because what sort of shape are we seeing? It's definitely not a line. It's definitely not a curve that has a single direction, so it is non-linear. And what would we say about the strength? Well, they seem pretty scattered about, right? Um, I mean, there is definitely a pattern there, but there is a lot of sort of variability to how the points fit that pattern. So we might call this only medium or maybe even weak. So this is certainly not a super strong pattern. They're sort of all over the place, but I mean, there definitely is some sort of pattern there, which is why we're calling it non-monotonic and non-linear. All right, let's try the third one here. For the third one, we're looking at the selling price of a pizza and the number of pizzas sold. So maybe we're studying something like a particular pizzeria or pizza delivery service, and we're saying, what price do they set the pizzas at and how many do they sell? Well, uh, we might say number of pizzas sold. Uh, it seems like that might be impacted by the selling price. So selling price seems to be here, that that should be the explanatory and the number of pizzas sold should be the response, right? People would see the price and then maybe use the price as a way of determining whether or not they wanna buy a pizza. So it seems like the selling price should impact how many pizzas we sell. Which of those sort of pictures makes sense here? Well, we should jump right to this one here. As the selling price gets lower, it gets uh, higher and higher. So as the price of the pizzas get higher and higher, the amount we sell get lower and lower. If we're charging tons of money, people aren't going to want to buy it. So this seems to go to graph two. So that means we would put the price here and the sales here. How would we describe this thing? Well, certainly this is negatively directed as the price goes up, as we go to the right, we generally see a decline in sales. So this would be negative. What form would we describe this as? Well, there doesn't really seem to be much of a bend here. So we would go ahead and describe this as linear. And we would probably call this strong because if we imagine sort of putting a line there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of sort of wiggle room for the points from that pattern. So this would be an example of a negative linear and probably pretty strong pattern. All right, we, know we can pretty much finish up the last one by process of elimination. But if we had these variables, IQ score and height, uh, it might be hard to decide which one's explanatory and which is response, but certainly we know height should be sort of fundamental. That should be explanatory. Uh, and maybe that impacts your IQ score in some way, though we probably should sort of doubt if there really is a relationship. And notice that the last picture we have, um, scatter plot three, is exactly the one that doesn't show any sort of relationship. So this should be to graph three, which would mean that we'd sort of be graphing height here and IQ here. And we'd be saying that there is no relationship. 
So this is again the picture saying that there is no relationship between these. Again, why does this picture represent no relationship? Well, if you think about it, just take some of these individuals. Here's an individual that is very short and has a very low IQ. Here's an individual that is pretty short and has a very high IQ. Here's a person who's very tall and has a very low IQ. Here's a person who's very tall and has a very high IQ, meaning that there's no real way to use height to tell you anything about people's IQ. It, just because you're shorter or taller doesn't have any impact on your intelligence. That's what we're seeing here, and that's exactly what it means to have no relationship. Okay, so this gives you guys a little bit more practice talking about explanatory and response, which is going to be important. Even as we get into actually having data sets, it's always going to be important to identify which variable is explanatory and which is response. A little bit of common sense about sort of connecting these to these different graphs, and then also making sure we're comfortable with this new language of direction, form, and strength. All right, let's finish this up by actually taking a data set and building our own scatter plot. Rather than just looking at ones and trying to talk about them, let's actually build one and then describe it. So let's suppose that we have a researcher that's studying how age affects reaction time. So to do this, they collect a random sample of 11 adults. They record the age of each adult and then administer a reaction test with the scores being recorded in milliseconds. So they get the following data. So the youngest person was 22 years old, and it took them 320 milliseconds to react to the test. Then there was a 25-year-old who only took 310 milliseconds, all the way up to somebody who was 45 and took 520 milliseconds to respond. So uh, this is the type of data that we're going to be working with. Notice that we have two variables, age and reaction time or reaction test. So two variables now, and notice they are both quantitative. Your age is a quantitative variable and the time it takes you to react is a quantitative var variable. So for all the correlation and regression stuff, we're gonna be seeing data like this. Now, right now, we're just gonna do the very basics of this. We're gonna identify which of these is explanatory and which is response. And then we're gonna construct a scatter plot for this data and do our best to describe the form and the direction. We'll talk briefly about the strength, but again, until we develop our measure for strength in the next video, we won't really be able to do too much with strength. All right, so let's start with explanatory and response. So do we think that it makes more sense that age impacts your reaction time? Or do we think it makes more sense to say that your reaction time impacts your age? Again, it should be clear that the age should be your explanatory and the reaction time should be your response. There's probably a lot of things that impact how quickly you can react, but in this situation, age should in some way impact reaction time. We would also expect that the older you are, the longer it takes you to react. So we're expecting that the higher the age, the higher the reaction time. Okay, well, let's go ahead and now that we've identified those, so this is part A, uh, just identifying which is which. Now remember, that is very important because when we go to draw the scatter plot, we need to know which is which so we know which variable goes on the horizontal and which goes on the vertical. Now for B, let's go ahead and construct our scatter plot. So we'll put a quadrant. All right, so this is going to be the reaction time which is our response, and this is going to be the age, which is our explanatory. Let's look at the ages and do that axis first. The ages go from 22 to 45. So might be convenient to just go mm, nice round numbers. Okay, we'll start at 20 and go by fives. So we'll start our axis at 20 and then 25, 30, 35, 40, and 45. Now, notice I have a consistent scale here, but I didn't have to start at zero, right? This whole section is technically, uh, there should be, a, this should be 15 and then 10 and then five and then zero, but that's not relevant to us. So we're smushing all that together. And to indicate that to a viewer, we put that squiggly line there telling us that all of zero through 20 has been condensed into that section. Let's do the same for the reaction time. The reaction times look like they were as low as 310 and they went all the way up to 560. So again, we can just sort of go by nice round numbers. Let's maybe go start at 300 and go by like 50s or something. So we can start this thing 300, 350, 400, 450, 500, 550, and 600 might not be a bad idea to include the units, milliseconds, and years here. Okay, 
So now let's go ahead and draw each of our points onto our graph. So our first person was 22 and had a reaction time of 320. So 22 would be located right about there and 320 would be located probably right about there. So we intersect those two together and that should be our first point right there. So there we go. There's our first individual who was 22 years old and took about 320 seconds to react. Now we'll go to the next person who is 25 and took 310. So they would be right about there. Okay. Then our third person who was 28 and took 390 seconds. So they should be probably right about there. All right. Then we had another person who was 28 who took 340 seconds. So they should be right about there. Notice that they're directly below him because they both were the same age. They were both 28. But of course, this second person had a lower reaction time of 340 compared to the other one who was 390. Then we had somebody who was 33 and took 370 seconds. So 33 and 370 should put them right about there. Okay. Then we had somebody who was 34 and took 430 seconds or milliseconds, sorry, 34 and 430. So right about there. And then another person who was 34 and took 460 milliseconds. So they should be right about there. Uh, then we had a person who was 39 and took 450 milliseconds. So 39 and 450, there we go. And then we had this person who was 40 and took 480 milliseconds. Right about there. Then we had this person who was 43 and took 560 milliseconds. Uh, so they should be right about there. And then we had this person who was 45 and took 520 milliseconds. So they should be right about there. And there we go. There's our first scatter plot we've constructed. So notice that we can see there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 dots because there were 11 individuals in our study. So remember, each dot on your scatter plot represents one individual. Each of these individuals had two variables recorded about them their age and their reaction time. How would we describe this? Well, certainly we can see that as age went up, we generally saw an increase in reaction time. It's not a strict increase, right? This person here, the 25 year old, had the best reaction time, the lowest reaction time of anybody, even though they were slightly older than this person. But generally speaking, if we were to describe the pattern, we see as age goes up, we generally are seeing an increase this way. So again, we're not looking for something that's true for every point, we're saying the general pattern. So we could describe this as positive, for sure. What sort of form? Well, at least what we're seeing, it seems to fit a pretty straight line. So we would go ahead and call this linear. And what strength? Well, again, we can't say too much about that. But if we imagine sort of a line there, it doesn't seem like there were the points were too far off of that. So we would say probably this is strong. And again, by our next video, we'll be have, we'll have a much sort of more formulaic way of actually diagnosing whether or not it's strong or weak. So there we go. That's our introduction to correlation and regression. Now we sort of know what we're setting up to do. We're trying to understand the relationship between variables. So far, we've described that visually. In our next video, we'll start to learn how to actually measure that strength. And then once we've done that, we can start making use of the relationship between variables.